Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and reading from the New King James Version, the Apostle Paul writes, along with two others, notice verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can see once again that Paul starts his letters by identifying himself, but also identifying who he's writing to, in this case, the church of the Thessalonians. Interesting, he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, which is not uncommon for Paul to include another person or persons in his writings. But notice this time he doesn't say an apostle of Jesus Christ as he normally would. And uh, maybe it's because Paul knows that all these people that he's writing to here, they already know who he is, but for whatever reason, he didn't feel inspired, he didn't feel motivated uh, to do that in this case. It doesn't make him any less of an apostle, and you'll see here that he still speaks with the same authority, the same revelation. In fact, he's going to bring some things out in this book that are not brought out in any other New Testament letter or book. So, so to the church of the Thessalonians, and then, of course, his famous greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Words release things. When Jesus said uh, to the leper, I am willing, be cleansed. Boy, those words released, along with him touching that leper, released the power of God. When God, in Genesis 1, said, let there be light, oh, the power of God was released through those words, to cause darkness to become light. And in the same way, Paul is speaking a greeting. It's not uh, merely a formality. It is something that he's saying as a gracious greeting. But I believe with all of my heart that from what I can see, they believe that when they would declare grace, uh, just like in Israel today when people say, instead of hello, they'll say shalom, peace that they may not mean it like that, but I think the original intent is that we're releasing and declaring peace to other people. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, verse two. We give thanks to God always for you, for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God our Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Uh, that's a bit of a mouthful, but let me just hit it quickly. It must have been comforting to the Thessalonians to know that the Apostle Paul is regularly giving thanks to God for this beautiful body of people, saints. They're not perfect by any means, but nonetheless, they're serving the Lord. They're working in their ministries. They're helping people to find the salvation that Jesus can only bring. And then he goes on to say, uh, we remember without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. And then he says this, knowing, beloved brethren, verse 4, your election by God. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. What does this mean? Well, the doctrine of election is uh, very established in the Word of God. Some people take it to uh, what I believe is an unscriptural extreme, which would say that if you're part of the elect, if you're part of those uh, of the election, which is a reality that God foresaw and has elected who would be saved and who would not be saved, that is a reality. But it's by foreknowledge that God, as Romans 8, I believe, uh, 29 says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 
And so whom he foreknew, he predestined or elected. See, so God knew who would receive him and who would not receive him. And so uh, if God knew you would, then you will. If God knew you wouldn't, then you won't because God knows the future, see? But uh, people that take the doctrine of election too far would say, oh, because God has already elected certain ones who will be saved and certain ones who will not be saved, then not everybody can be saved. And so there's no sense preaching the gospel and trying to get somebody saved if they're not part of the elect. Uh, and it would even say, and some would believe, that Jesus, when he died on the cross, did not die for the sins of the whole world, but he only died for the sins of the elect because those are the only ones that could be saved. Well, I, I dismiss that as unscriptural because there are so many scriptures in the Bible that talk about the whole world. God desires, 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, if they can't all come to repentance, why is it saying that? See, and so, and even John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, see, these scriptures, along with many, many others, say very emphatically that anybody who puts their faith in Jesus will be saved. However, God knows who they will be, who will receive, and who they will be, who will not receive. And those elect, God has elected them, and he's, he's doing that in such a way because he wants to protect them. He wants to protect those who will choose, have chosen and will choose, to be his family and to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus. And so there's something of a protection. So it's a, a bit of a complex uh, topic for uh, a lot of people. But nonetheless, I don't think it's uh, too complex for us to resolve, especially if we took the time just to bring up scripture after scripture. The doctrine of election is certainly in the Bible, but so is the doctrine that Jesus died for the sins of the world. And whoever comes and believes in him can be saved. Of course, God knew they would be, <laughs> so they would be part of the elect. So anyway, they really don't conflict with one another when you see it in the right light. So God's, uh, Paul says again in verse 4, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, for our gospel uh, did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So Paul is saying, listen, we didn't come and just preach some cheesy, weak gospel that we don't live we didn't come with a gospel where nobody ever gets healed, nobody ever gets their prayers answered, there's no power involved in this gospel. He said, no, we came and preached a gospel and there was power, there was evidence to show that the God that we preached is a real God and he responds and he answers prayer. And, and he said, you also noticed the way we lived. We lived as if we really believe this gospel and we're not just in it for money or for fame or anything like that. Verse six, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy, excuse me, with joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became examples to all Macedonia and Achaia who believe. And, and Paul said, you accepted this gospel and embraced it and ran with it so well that you, Thessalonians, have been an example all over the region. And so verse 8, for from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. Paul's saying, we don't need to brag on you. Everybody already knows how you live for the Lord and how you really walk according to the principles of God's word. Verse 9, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So Paul said, we don't have to say anything. In fact, they tell us 
how effective it was for us to come to you, Thessalonians, and to preach to you because you not only received the gospel and prayed to receive Jesus, but you're living this out. You turned away from your idols. You got rid of all those idols. And you are now waiting for the Son of God, Jesus, to come back a second time whom God has raised from the dead, and, uh, and believing that you'll be delivered from the wrath to come. There is a wrath coming. Well, let me tell you, the end of the age, I feel like it's coming in the not-too-distant future. Uh, the book of Revelations, the tribulation period and such, oh, I believe we're watching things line up. I don't have any idea how close we are, but it seems to me like this thing could happen in, uh, in not that many years from now. And so... Uh, may we be like the Thessalonians, and may we get our hearts right if they're not right, and may we really serve the Lord with all fervency. Thank you again for watching today. If you haven't already done it, click the like button and share this video with others to help them get into God's Word. Also, we'd love to partner with you to advance the kingdom of God. To find out more about our BFAM strategy, our ministry school, the BFAM Training Center, other great teaching resources, or to launch a house church, visit solidlives.com. Thank you again, and I'll see you tomorrow.